Well, hello, everybody. Let me get your attention. I apologize uh, for a little bit of a late start. I was just jabbing away at my table and uh, happened to look at my watch. But I want to welcome you here to the Alpha course. Uh, we are so grateful to have you all here this evening. Uh, I know some folks are watching uh, live stream and we welcome you as well. If you, if you are watching live stream and you'd like to get a manual to follow along with the course, just let us know. Just call the church 504-482-6221 and we will get you a manual if you'd like to follow through the course that way. That would be great. We would love for you to be connected in that way as well. Well, <clears throat> let me take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, but before I do that, how many of you guys are here for the very first time? It's your first alpha. Just raise your hand. Wow, that is a great turnout. Thank you for being here. So a little bit smaller crowd than we usually have. We typically have about 150 or so, but this is a great number of first timers. And we, we trust you are going to enjoy yourselves. And, uh, but let me just tell you, um, my name is Frank Loria. I have the privilege of being one of the, well, the presenter, not one of the presenters, the presenters at the Alpha course. This is our 42nd Alpha. So we actually did our very first Alpha a week to the day after 9-11. So that was a very interesting first Alpha. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me, then I'll give you a little bit of a history of the Alpha course. Okay, you already know what you ate for dinner, so I can just maybe go, okay. Um, uh, um, and why I believe it's going to be worth your while to come over the course of the next seven weeks. I think the reason we've done this for so many years and we've had so many people attend is because people that have attended tell people that, hey, I attended this thing and it was worth coming to. I mean, it's, it's certainly worth what you're paying to be here, right? I mean, it's um, so, um, so we hope you can make it for as many Tuesdays as you possibly can. A little bit about me. Um, I just recently sold my business. I retired from a company that I was uh, I owned for and was a part of for about 44 years, and and now I spend a little, a little bit more time actually here at the church. I'm one of the, I'm a volunteer uh, elder here, and uh, my wife and I we've attended uh, Lakeview Christian Center for just over 43 years. So that's a long time. Yeah, no other church will take us. We've interviewed at a lot of places. Um, but before I go any further, I want to introduce to you uh, my gorgeous uh, wife, Annette. Sweetheart, would you just stand up for a moment and just let everyone see how... Uh, she is my wife of 44 years, uh, 11 months, 27 days. God, our anniversary is Saturday. Um, happy anniversary. 45 years on Saturday, we will be married. And uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, applaud for her. She definitely uh, is. Uh, but we have three grown kids who are married to three other grown kids uh, who have given us 12 growing grandkids. Um, both Annette and I grew up in New Orleans. Annette went to Dominican. Uh, I went to an all-boy military school called New Orleans Academy, and I have the distinction of graduating in the top 18 of my class of 21. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I chose not to pursue a college education, so I attended Louisiana State University, where, where, <laughs> where you, I mean, where I could pursue so many other things that I couldn't pursue at home. So, I mean, just get far enough away from home. Uh, I was a, a member of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity. I was a, uh, Brian, I was a deke at LSU, and... Um, and that's really where I first met Annette, uh, swinging from a chandelier, actually. And uh, that's where she, she first caught my eye uh, with her heel. And then um, knee, shoulder, down we went. And uh, she's just been all over me ever since then. So um, at least that's the way I am saying it over and over again. So I actually believe it. Um, but uh, the Alpha Course actually started uh, back in London, England in 1977. It was just a little fledgling Bible study in this Anglican church called Holy Trinity Church of Brompton. And a pastor by the name of Nicky Gumbel set out uh, to take that little Bible study and to turn it into something. And boy, did he. And by, in 1985, he took it out the confines of Holy Trinity Brompton Church. And today, the Alpha Course 
is taught in 130 different, no, 100, over 130 countries in 100, over 100 languages. Over 30 million people have attended the Alpha course over the decades. And, and, and folks from every, virtually every Christian denomination have come. Like I said a moment ago, we've done Alpha here since 2001. We've had, I think our numbers are over 8,000 people have attended the Alpha course here. And again, from virtually every denomination, um, we've had many Catholic priests come to the Alpha course. Uh, one of my favorites is Father Beau Charbonnet from St. Angela Marisi Church. And Father Beau sat about right there where Ron is sitting. Uh, and he brought his entire Christian education folks with him. And, and this is what, what Beau did. He was so sharp. He said, nobody can sit at the same table. So he spread out his whole team everywhere so they could have their own experience. And, it's, and, and we have been so honored because Bo has said, he even put it in writing, that uh, when other uh, Catholic uh, priests and pastors have come to him or deacons have come to him and said, hey, Bo, we want to come to St. Angela to, to see how to do Alpha. And Bo says to them, no, 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 you go to Lakeview Christian Center. And it's like, well, Bo, that is, gosh, I hope we can live up to that. But that's very kind of you. So, uh, this, is, uh, this has nothing to do with denomination. Let me tell you, before I tell you even more about what, what Alpha is, let me tell you what Alpha is not. Alpha is not a membership drive of Lakeview Christian Center, okay? Uh, this Alpha is not about trying to get you to change your church or denomination, okay? Alpha is an opportunity to come and find out what, what does the Bible really say? It's an opportunity to come and think some opportunity to come and reason together. And I say think. I mean, I know, I know in your job you have to think. But typically when it comes to things, maybe spiritual, we just really don't think that much. We don't really give deep thought into that because we're so busy doing so many other things. And so Alpha provides a, just a non-threatening atmosphere. When, I, when I'm done in a minute, you're just going to turn your chairs around and just have a conversation. You can just say whatever you want. Ask whatever you want. It's just that type of setting. And, and though people, I'm grateful, enjoy a little bit of what, what I'm saying, the things that we hear every year without fail. We do this twice a year. So every time we do Alpha without fail is, you know, thanks, Frank. But the cool t stuff was at the tables. The conversations that we had were just the best and got to know folks, got to make friends, got to think about stuff I just hadn't thought about in a long time. I'm just kind of a spiritual walking zombie. I'm not paying any attention. I'm just checking spiritual boxes. Um, and so Alpha gives us that opportunity to, to just do that, just to kind of tap the brakes on our hundred mile an hour lives and pause and think about things that if there is a God, and if the Bible's true, are really important for you and me to, to think about. So I'm hoping that we can do that. Uh, it, was, it was Socrates that, that said something I'm going to tell you in just a minute. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I forgot that I wanted to tell you just to give you a quick rundown of the, of the class. So um, I've only done this 40 times. So I mean, give me a little break. Um, so for tonight, we're going to talk about is there more to life than this. Is there, is there more to just great career or okay career and then retirement and then life goes by so fast the next thing you know you're in the grave? Uh, our second session, who is Jesus? It may seem like a dumb question to Americans. But let me tell you, there's a whole lot more to who Jesus is than what we think. We're going to talk about the Bible. Why should I believe the Bible? Why should I read the Bible? Did the resurrection actually happen? So that and so much more. Third session, why did Jesus die? I thought I knew. I was wrong. There's so much more to this question than you and I just know in a cursory glance or a religion class. Fourth, how can I have faith? Or can I be sure of what I believe? Can I know what God thinks of me? Can I really know that? Or do I just hope if I'm, when I die, I'm just going to die on a good day and I just keep my fingers crossed? Okay, can I, how can I have faith? My, I, I've retitled that, can I be sure of what I believe? Can I be sure of my faith? Next session, five, why and how should I read the Bible? A lot of us wonder, I mean, you see this big book and you go, uh, where do you start? What's in it? 
Is there anything here relevant to my life? Why would I read this? This is, this is a good session as well. Six, six, how can I resist evil? Why is there evil? How much evil is in me? Uh, these, these are questions. These deal with the issues in the world of what is going on. How can I resist that? Session seven, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, this sounds like a, an interesting question, but it really is. The, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being a person who's very active in the world. Now, that's either true or not true. But when we get there, you're going to see as we, as we progress in the course who the Holy Spirit is and why he is really important and uh, it, just an essential portion, part of what is going on in the way in which God communicates with us. And the eighth session, what about the church? I, mean, I, I went to church my whole life, made many deals with God, and, but really didn't know what the Bible had to say about what church is and why church is. There's a lot of stereotypes that we're going to be looking at over the weeks that we're just are sometimes maybe just traditional thinking, uh, assumptive thinking, stereotypical thinking, but they don't line up with what the Bible says. Now, when I tell you that, I'm not asking you to believe the Bible. If you don't get anything out of this course, even if you don't come back after tonight, hopefully you'll begin to look at, okay, what does... At least you'll know what the Bible says and what the Bible doesn't say. We assume a lot of things of what the Bible says that it doesn't say. And we assume a lot of things of the, that the Bible doesn't say that it does say. And so at least come to this course to find out what is in the Bible and what's not in the Bible. At least get straight and remove the stereotypes because the Bible has a whole lot to say about who whether you believe it or not, and, and by the way, whether you believe it or not has nothing to do with whether or not it's true. If I don't believe the Bible, it doesn't make it not true. If I do believe the Bible, it doesn't make it true. So the question is, is it the truth? Is it more than just some antiquated book that deserves no, nothing more than a, a, a position on a coffee table? never to be opened. And so I'm hopeful that you're here to find out more about what is in this. What does it have to say about God? What does it have to say about me? You know, it was Socrates, I hope, that said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Okay? In other words, the unexamined life, he, I, I'll just change this up a little bit. The unexamined life is not life. Don't you question? Shouldn't we question what we believe or why we believe what we believe? And that's what we're going to do with Alpha. We're going to talk about not just, well, what do you believe? Frank, what do you believe? Well, why do you believe that? Really, why do you believe that? So, and I guess for us to begin to, if we can just click this un off of this and to say the examined life is worth living, then how can we examine what the Bible has to say and its authority and its validity and its relevance to each and every one of our lives? And I will argue that if it's true, it is relevant to every one of our lives in this room. Every one of you watching live stream, it is relevant, pertinent, important to all of our lives if it's the truth. So let's just not leave it to assumption that, eh, don't believe it. Okay, let's talk about why. So the unexamined life is not worth living, and I'm take too, taking too much time on that one quote. But, but it was this guy, Os Guinness, author, teacher. Here's a quote that he had that I think is really good, and, or, or else I wouldn't have put it up here if I didn't think it was really good. But this is what he wrote. He said, most of us feel immortal in our teens and 20s, if we can remember our teens and 20s. Then move through life so fast in our 30s and 40s that we lose sight of the journey and think only of our careers. Now, I know some of you are tracking with me here. Even in our 50s, we barely hear the roar of the rapids several bends down 
River. Here's the question. Have you awakened? Have you awakened to the journey of life or are you among those drifting down the years? Are you among those so caught up on the project of themselves that they choose not to hear the flow of time? Here's Socrates. Are you living an examined life? Or are you living in the hand-me-down ideas of others? Are you open to the full interrogation of life? Hmm. Or are you closed to the search because you believe what you've always believed without question? Now, hopefully what Alpha will do will just cause us to bring up some questions. Think about things we hadn't thought about because we're too stinking busy. So, and you, we would think that people that have made it, people that we would call successful, well, they certainly don't have any question about meaning and purpose, right? Well, apparently they do. Let me just give you a few of them here. Here's Shia LaBeouf. Now, this is an old quote, but I've looked for newer quotes from him, and I can't find anything worth using. So we're going to stick with this one. He says, Sometimes, this is a, a, a Parade Magazine interview. He said, sometimes I feel I'm living a meaningless life and I get frightened. I know I'm one of the luckiest dudes in America right now. I got a great house. My parents don't have to work. I got money. I'm famous. But it could all change, man. It could all go away. You never know. He said, I don't handle fame well. Most actors on most days, don't think they're worthy. And yet, because they think they're more than worthy, maybe. But uh, I got no idea where this insecurity comes from. Look what he says. But it's a God-sized hole. If I knew, I'd fill it. And I'd be on my way. Interesting. Now, many of us have heard the name Tom Brady, Right? Uh, I think he's finally retired for the last time, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Now, this is an interview. Now, I'm going to show you an interview of Tom Brady from 2000 and I think it's five. Um, it's an old one, but what I, if I could, I'd, I'd take a collection and I'd give Tom Brady the money if I could interview him and ask him the question that Steve Croft from uh, 60 Minutes asks him on what life is all about. Michael, you got that? Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew. I mean, it's... I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. But there's a... I know I love playing football and I love being the quarterback for this team. And But at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. Hmm. Yeah. So fast forward 2023. Wouldn't I love that? Now you got seven, Tom. And you got one less wife. What's life to you? It's interesting. Uh, Ted Turner, right? Founded CNN, Turner Network Television, uh, worth $2.2 billion. Uh, during an interview with Barbara Walters, Barbara asked him the question, what do you mean by success, Ted? What to you is successful? And this is what he said. Look, look at what Ted Turner, $2.2 billion. He replied, I think it's kind of an empty bag, to tell you the truth. You have to get there to really know that. Money doesn't buy happiness, and neither does honors or position and awards or trophies. Hmm. That's Ted Turner then. Looking good. Here's Ted Turner today. Looking old. 
right? It, you know, the, the death rate, did you hear this? The death rate is 100%. Um, and what this guy, who's got 2.2 billion, uh, says it doesn't buy happiness, neither do honors, positions, awards, trophies. It's, he says, Ted Turner said it's an empty bag. Here's our favorite crazy man, Jim Carrey. If you're, if you ever follow, anybody follow Jim Carrey? Anybody? Just, I know you don't want to raise your hand, but the guy's nuts, all right? But, he said, but I love what he said here. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Hmm, interesting. Richard Barton, he was the cartoon of the stars back in the 20s. Uh, this is a note that he wrote. He said, I've had few difficulties, many friends, great successes. He wrote this when he was 39 years old. I've gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited great countries of the world, but I am fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours a day. Now, that was a note that was found on his pillow after, Ted, after Mr. Barton, Ralph Barton, had taken a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. See, I mean, look at this. Few difficulties. I mean, he's even admitting, hey, life's still pretty easy. Got a bunch of friends, great successes, experienced wives, houses, traveled all over the world. I mean, who wouldn't want to do this? But I'm sick of trying to invent ways to make meaning to my life, no matter what I try to fill it with. It's like there's a hole in my bucket. Now, what you need to do is you need to go to UCLA and study philosophy so you can make sense of life. And this is what the head of the department, Donald Kalish, who was the head of the philosophy department at UCLA for, from 66, I think, to 74. He said, there's no system of philosophy to spin out. Imagine just being in his classroom right now. There's no system of philosophy to spin out. There are no ethical truths. They're just clarifications of particular ethical problems. Take advantage of these clarifications and work out your own existence. You are mistaken to think that anyone ever had the answers. Hmm. Mistaken to think anyone ever had the answers. There are no answers. Be brave and face up to it. The final exam is on Friday. I mean, really? Now, it's interesting. With all due respect to the late Dr. Kalish, he kind of contradicts himself when he says there are no answers. To say there are no answers is, in fact, to, an answer to the question, are there any answers? The professor also said that life has no purpose. And yet, Dr. Barton obviously made it his purpose in life to tell students life has no purpose. So are we all just a cosmic accident? Are we all just here by chance that there is no order? There is no reason? There is no purpose? Why do we feel like there is then? Why do each of us strive for that? It's just the human condition to look for meaning and purpose. So I thought I'd do this. I thought I'd get you to think for a second. Would you just put your quote here? I mean, we looked at Dr. Barton. We looked at Ralph, uh, Dr. Kalish. We looked at Ralph Barton. We looked at Jim Carrey, Tom Brady. But everyone has a statement. Everyone has a mission statement. Everyone has a purpose statement, a reason statement. Have you thought about what yours is? What would yours look like? Would we put you up here? <laughs> I think about that. But as we think about all these different philosophies, particularly as we just look at Dr. Kalish for a second, the Bible takes issue with Dr. Kalish. The Bible that I had never read does claim to have answers to life's essential questions. Now, let me just ask you a question just real quick. I, I'm just if you'd raise, just raise your hand briefly. How many of you, this was something, as a matter of life, this is just something you did commonly. How many of you all just as a common course of your life read or studied the Bible? You just kind of grew up and that's what you did. It was a common way of your life. Just go ahead. Don't, don't be afraid to raise your hand up. One, two, three, four, 
Oh, come on. You're being shy. Five, one, two, three, four. You're only 12, Grace. It doesn't count. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, then raise your hand. You're going to be 13. Okay, so in a room here of about a little over 100 people, I got six, if I count, five and a half hands if I count Grace. Uh, uh, um, so, and I, and I think about that. That's 95% of the room grew up without reading or knowing what's in the Bible. Now, that's fascinating to me uh, because the Bible claims to have answers to worldview questions about where'd I come from? Where am I going? But the most important question, why am I here? The Bible claims that God made us in his image. Again, not asking you to believe it, but this is what it says. Made us in his image like no other creature to have meaning and purpose and value. So if the Bible, though, is true, Jesus made some incredible claims. We're going to talk about that a whole lot more next week. Because he said, he claimed that he came into the world to give us life abundantly. Now, why would he come to give us something we already have unless his definition of life and our definition of life are two different things? You know, think about that. But to believe that requires faith. To believe that requires faith. To believe, well, let me just ask you this. Are, are you a person of faith? Do you have faith? Uh, not so much? Well, everybody has faith. The most ardent spiritual person has faith. And the most ardent atheist has faith. Right? Really? I mean, think about that. But here's the thing I want to get across. Faith is not something that is necessarily spiritual or religious. Faith is something we exercise all the time. I mean, how many has been watching the weather lately? A lot. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, how, I mean, just, uh, here, here's, okay. You know, I mean, a lot of times you get this, but you know, the weatherman will tell you, it's going to be a glorious weekend, man. No problems. Just get out there, barbecue, just have the time of your life. There's no chance of there being any rain whatsoever. And don't you wish, so we accept what the weatherman said by faith, but don't you wish they could only get it wrong so many times, right? And the next time they miss a rain cell, they head to a jail cell. Just get them off. Just get them out of here. Um, but again, faith. No question. Faith. I mean, you drove here tonight, right? I assume everybody drove here tonight. Did you know you were going to get here? I mean, I went out to the parking lot and looked at some of your cars. Some of you exercise more faith than others. But, but did you know when you stopped and then you start off, went from the stop sign that the person next to you was going to stop? Did you know when your light turned green that the other one turned red? I mean, it's not irrational faith, but it's faith. Right? You've been in a car accident. It's faith to get on the road. So we exercise faith all the time. Did, did you enjoy your meal tonight? I hope you enjoyed your meal tonight. Um, did any of you meet the chef? No. I took a picture of him before I came out here tonight. Um, <laughs> you ate in faith. And I watched some of you eat and eat and eat in faith. Um, now, I mean, let's just say that the chef was just really, just really, he's sick of cooking for Alpha and all these people. Uh, and so he decides to add a little bit more into the dishes tonight than he should have. Something more in the salad dressing. I hope you didn't have the salad dressing because you seem particularly angry around that. Um, but around 2 o'clock this morning, all of a sudden you're doubled over. You're in agony and you've got to get to the hospital and you're, you're looking for... A doctor, is this the doctor you're looking for? Okay, but don't you go to a doctor in faith? Right? I mean, you're looking at the, the, the diplomas on the wall. You're, you know, if you need surgery, I mean, you're going to try to find people. Hey, did you have that surgery? Did you use this doctor? Uh, you're looking for all the evidence you can to support your faith position. That that's the, not this guy, but that's the guy. That's the doctor that should cut on me. I mean, so we exercise faith every day. How many of you guys like to fly? Enjoy getting in a plane and flying. Weird people. Okay. Uh, you do that for a living, Jen. So, um, 
But okay, so how many again? Just go ahead. Just okay. So again, more. Okay, more enjoy flying than have read the Bible. So I understand that. <laughs> um, so, but um, how about don't you wish you were on this flight? Okay, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 from LaGuardia to Charlotte, January 15, 2009. Air temperature 18 degrees. Water temperature, 35 degrees. I mean, doesn't this bring new meaning to uh, flying on a wing in a prayer? I mean, just... But, you know, what happens? They're taking off from LaGuardia, and what happens? These birds go right through the, the engines. Did anybody expect that to happen? Did anybody pay extra so they could glide into the Hudson? No. But you get on an airplane, you put 100% of yourself into an object that... It's reliable, but it's still faith, isn't it? We exercise faith all the time. We all have faith. Anybody ever serve on a, on a, a jury? Okay, serve a jury. So, and when the, when the judge charges you, what does he say? He charges you to make a decision. Does he say beyond a shadow of a doubt? Is that what he or she says? No, beyond a reasonable doubt. Does the evidence support Either, uh, uh, either finding guilty or finding innocent, the defendant. True or false, what took place. So we exercise faith all the time. So, well, let me ask you this question now. And just, if you would, thank you for raising your hands. Um, how many of you believe there's something on the other side of your last heartbeat, okay? On the other side of physical life, and you believe it's going to last forever and you hope it's going to be good. Okay. So, all right. So most of us have raised their hand. A lot more people than have read the Bible have raised their hand, hoping this. Um, now, what I want to do is I want to ask uh, Charles if you would come. And Lauren, would you come on up here? Um, so, this is Charles Abbott. Charles. Charles is the, going to represent physical life. And does he not represent <laughs> yeah, 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 stand that way, it's better. I'll suck in. You look bigger on, you look skinnier on TV or? Bigger. Bigger? Oh, okay, sorry. Sarah, would you rather come up? No, no, they take Okay, so, so, Charles is representing physical life. So, so hold that in that hand and then put that up to the end of it. And Lauren, if you would, just take this and bring it all the way to the coffee machine. Okay. All right. You're doing great. Now, so this represents physical life here. Now, this is the beginning of life. This is the end of life. Now, none of us know where we are toward the end of life. Do you? Do you know how many more days you have? How many more years you have? How many more minutes you have? How many more decades you have? Do you know? I mean, none of us know, right? But you guys just said a minute ago, at least the vast majority of you, you believe there's something on the other side of your last heartbeat and you believe it's going to last forever. This is looking like it's just kind of... You can say... <laughs> Uh, all right, that you believe it's going to last forever. Now, here's my question. Why is it if we believe that there's something on the other side of our last heartbeat that's going to last forever and we believe it's going to be good, why do we spend so much time? Not that we shouldn't spend time critically examining things in our short physical life, but why do we spend so much time thinking about what we're going to study, uh, where we're going to live, what kind of car we're going to buy, um, where our kids are going to go to school, uh, the neighborhoods we're going to live in. I mean, God forbid we get the wrong cell phone policy and we end up in cell phone hell for two years, right? Um, but we spend all our vacations, we spend more time thinking about how planning for our vacations than we actually spend on our vacations. But we spend a tremendous amount of time in what we know is going to last a very brief amount of time but when it comes to what's going to happen that we believe happens on the other side of our last the very last heartbeat, why do we leave that to assumption? Why would we spend so much time, which we should, being so concerned about the things that make up a very, look, I got to, I'm going to be 67 
in October. I don't know how that happened. I mean, I, I, I still feel like I'm 35. I know I'm deceiving myself, but I still like, how did that happen? But so much time, and something's going to last a very brief time, but we say, well, I hope so. I think so. I, I've been a pretty good person. But should we leave something that we believe is going to last forever to assumption or hope so's? The question is, can we know? And I think we can know. Before you guys go, I want to just throw up just two quick. C.S. Lewis was a devout atheist. You've heard of C.S. Lewis, his books, The Chronicles of Narnia, they've turned into movies. Lewis was a devout atheist until he became a devout follower of Jesus. He said this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. See, we just talked a minute ago about the, the numbers of people that have reached the top of the, you know, climbed the ladder of success just to find out that their ladder, once they got there, was, re, was leaning up against the wrong building. Right? So Lewis realized this. If, there, if nothing in the world can satisfy me, and there is something on the other side of my last heartbeat that's going to last forever. Maybe I'm spending too much time thinking only about this. And I need to give some much more thought to what you said you believe, and I believe, is going to last forever. One more quote from Lewis. He says, you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. You aim at earth, you're going to, you don't get either one. Now, that's either true or false, but that's what... This guy, former devout, devoted atheist, follower of Christ became. Could you thank them for this amazing job? Of... Thank, you, sir. thank you, Lauren. You did that so well. This is her first time. She's a rookie doing this. Thank you. You measured up to what I... <clears throat> <laughs> oh, you love that. Okay. Um, so, Ray Pritchard, this is what Ray Pritchard had to say. It's an interesting quote from Pritchard. He said, we were made to know God. Okay. We're incurably religious by nature. That's why every human society, no matter how primitive, has some concept of a higher power, some vision of reality that goes beyond the natural, beyond our last heartbeat. We just... We, it's, it's kind of intrinsic to us. Uh, St. Augustine, okay, he was like, he was the Hugh Hefner of the 300s, okay? I mean, this guy, if you know anything about the history of Hefner, I mean, I mean Hefner, <laughs> of Augustine, this guy was a party animal. He was way, way ahead of his time. But then guess what? He comes to know the person of Jesus Christ. He didn't get religion. He came to, to read the scriptures and to see who Jesus Christ was. And he's written many amazing things, but just a little quote from the many of the amazing things he wrote. He said, you have made us, this is a prayer, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. I mean, restless, hopeless even. I mean, what has happened in the last two, three years since COVID. You talk about restless. You talk about fractured. You talk about broken, divided. I mean, we, we just seem to have trouble finding our way. And that's the Bible's declaration of the necessity. Yet, yeah, believe it or not, the necessity, the Bible's declaration of the necessity of the incarnation of the Son of God. And if you will, heaven's rescue mission to win us wayward humans back to God. Now, possibly you see Christianity as maybe one of three things, boring or irrelevant or untrue or maybe all of the above. But my hope is that if you'll stay through the process of attending Alpha and hearing some of the things we'll talk about, we hope that it will begin, to, you'll begin to see that there is some pretty amazing evidence supporting the claims 
that Jesus Christ makes about himself and that the Bible makes about itself. So, throughout the Bible, I saw declarations that Jesus made about himself that were contrary to what I, completely contrary to what I sincerely assumed about his purpose of coming to earth. And I'm going to touch on three things right here as I hopefully am closing in the next about 10 minutes. So touch on three things that, that if true, have dash, physical life, and the line, okay, I'll just call that physical life, the dash, and the line, consequences and ramifications, both now and on the other side of our last heartbeat. Uh, Jesus, uh, according to the Apostle John, he wrote this, that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, that's a pretty amazing statement, pretty arrogant statement, if not true. He is saying he is the way to God. He is the truth about God, and he is the very life of God. He didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life. The definite article is clearly implanted in the Greek there. So let's just talk about these three things. Believe it or not, let's just see what it has to say. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say rules were the way, or commandments were the way, or laws were the way, or church attendance was the way, or sincere praying, or confessions were the way, or do-gooding was the way. He said, I am the way. There's a big delineation there. And we'll talk much more about that next week and in week three. Um, see, Jesus understood, according to the Bible, the condition of every one of our, every one of us. Every one of our hearts, restless, unsettled, wayward, empty, self-centered, confused, heartbroken. I mean, you can just fill in more. What, you got some more adjectives that could describe that? Of course. But the heart of Christianity, as I said, is not rule-keeping. If what the Bible says is true, the heart of Christianity is knowing what the Bible says is God incarnate Jesus Christ personally. Here's one thing that Jesus said about being the way. John quotes him, and it's in the 10th verse. It's the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book of the New Testament, the 10th chapter, the 9th and the 10th verses. The Bible didn't originally have chapters and verses. It was just written as letters, but these were added. Chapters and verses were added so that you could find things more easily. It was broken up that way. Jesus said, I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. I came that they, meaning humans, might have life and have it abundantly. He said, I am the door. If anyone through me, uh, enters through me, he will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from entering the wrong door. Saved from believing the wrong things. He says, he'll go in and out and find pasture. Pasture is a place of security, of feeding, of peace. And who, who of us wouldn't want that? A sense of security and peace and sustenance. He said, I came that they might have life. As I said earlier, he wouldn't come to give us something we already have. He must have a different definition of that. He also said that he is... Not only the way, but the, the truth. Now, some would ask, particularly in the realm of religion, isn't it enough just to be sincere about what you believe? Does it really matter what you believe as long as you believe it sincerely? Um, well, but what does sincerely have to do with the truth? You can believe something totally sincerely and still be sincerely wrong. Because I believe sincerely about things about Jesus, but I found out when I started doing some examination, like, well, what I'm saying, either I'm right or the Bible's right. I'm not sure which one, but we completely contradicted one another. Does it matter what I believe? Does declaring what is true for me make it true? Let me just, just give you some examples of this, and I'm rapidly running out of time. Okay, it's not what you believe, but that you believe. I mean, again, I'm not trying to poke on that. Well, yeah, I am. I'm really trying to poke on that a little bit. But, but I mean, I'm not going to make a big deal of that other than to say, 
it's not what you believe, but that you believe. Let's just kind of tease that out a little bit more. Um, it's not what you eat, but that you eat. Now, I know we live in New Orleans, so it probably doesn't matter. But would any of us say this? It's not what you eat, but that you eat. How about this? It's not what you breathe, but that you breathe. I, I know Gabe worked at a chemical plant. Gabe, would you say it's not what you breathe, but that you breathe? Just no, not a chance, right? Um, how about it's not what you invest in, Brian, but that you invest, right? Anybody going to believe that? I don't think so. Okay. Now, here's one. I, I may be wrong because okay, I see some of y'all are getting old in the room and, and this hasn't happened yet. Um, it's not what you marry, but that you marry, right? So, well, you know, it's kind of getting a little desperate here. So, uh, um, but, but we just don't live that way. We do not live that way. But, you know, the great high priestess of all things wise, Oprah Winfrey, um, said that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Well, what if your truth is not the truth? Is that okay just to say something is the truth because it's true to you? It makes it true? None of us think that way, really. None of us live that way. The truth is the truth, whether I believe it or not. My truth is self-substantiating. Truth doesn't care whether I believe it or not. Truth is truth. And we may say that one of the things that bothers us about Christianity is that it's exclusive. You probably heard that. It's just so exclusive. But hear this. All religions are exclusive. Every religion is exclusive. And some things can't all be true at the same time. Right? So if, if, if Islam is saying... Allah is the one true God, and Jesus Christ, Jesus did not die on the cross. Somebody took his place on the cross. And Christianity says, no, Jesus is God, died on the cross, was resurrected on the third day. Either Islam is false, or Christianity is false, or they're both false. Okay? Mormons believe that Jesus and Lucifer were spirit brothers. Mormons believe that the God of this world was once a human just like you and I. And he married a bunch of women and uh, he populated a planet. I mean, check this out. I'm not just making this up. Okay? Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is not God at all. He is Michael the Archangel. Uh, and I could go on and on and on. Hindus believe in millions of gods. Buddhists believe in no god. Do you see what I'm saying? But they're all making exclusive statements. The question is not, that's an exclusive statement, but the question is, is any of them the truth? Is there evidence to support any one of them being something I could put, wrap my brain and my heart around? But what I love is that the God of the Bible didn't ask for you and me to check our brain at the door. As a matter of fact, way back in the Jewish scriptures, the great Jewish prayer is called the Shema. In Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah, or the Tanakh, this is what Moses writes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. Okay? Look at that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, to the Jew, that's your whole being. With all your soul. We just call that our emotions. With all your mind and all your strength. So, the God, the Judeo-Christian God says, I want you to use your mind. The mind that I gave you. In humble search and inquiry. So Jesus also taught this, almost done. He said, I'm the way, the truth. And he said, I am the life. Now, the Bible teaches, again, I'm not asking you to believe this, that we were made in the image of God. But we marred that image. That image was marred when our progenitors, Adam and Eve, rebelled from God and said, we will do this our way, not your way. And so the result of that is we have become separated from God. We're going to talk a whole lot more about this in week three. 
He told them the day, he said, I put in, before you in this garden a bunch of trees, a bunch of fruitful trees. But there are two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of this you shall surely die. And they ate of the tree, and they didn't drop over dead, but they did die in their relationship to a holy God. And then they died in their open, intimate relationship to one another. And then they died physically. So what does Jesus say? Why does Jesus say he is the life? Because he came to give us something that we forfeited through our parents. And there's ample evidence to show it. Whether we're two years old or 22 years old or 82 years old. The only difference between a two-year-old showing self-centeredness and an 82-year-old showing self-centeredness is the complexity of the way in which we deceive and do what we do. It was Ernest Henley that, that wrote this poem, Invictus. And this is the last stanza of the poem. He says, it matters not how straight the gate. Now, what he's doing, he's alluding there to Matthew 7 where Jesus says, the way is narrow and hard that leads to life. So, it matters not how straight the gate. doesn't matter what Jesus is saying. Or how fraught with punishment the scroll. You see what he's talking about there. Ten commandments. doesn't matter what Moses is saying. I'm the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, Mr. Henley has been away from us from, for well over 100 years. So, I... I don't know where his boat is right now as the master of his fate and the captain of his soul, um, but he knows for sure now uh, that by Mr. Henley, with all due respect, is a statement of faith. What did he back that up with? What do we back up our statement of faith with? What is the evidence that would support what the Bi how the Bible backs up its statement? Of faith. So Jesus comes into the middle of our self-reliance and says, Frank, you're heading in the wrong direction. I'm the way. Frank, you're believing a lie, but I'm the truth. And when it comes to your relationship with me, Frank, because of your sin and your self-centeredness, we're separated, you're dead, but I have come to give you a relationship with me. I've come to give you life. Because you need my life. <clears throat> so, uh, this is a Bible passage that maybe we're familiar with. But the Gospel of John, the third chapter, John writes this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, not asking you to believe that that's true or false, but that's a statement that's in the Bible. But let's just for a moment suppose that that is true. And what we would do is instead of removing this big wor word, the world, these two words, the world, let's just slap your name in there. For God so loved Bob that God gave Bob his only son. That if Bob believes in him, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the word believe in the Bible actually means. It's not some mental assent. It's a surrendering of control kind of word. Whoever believes, if Bob believes in him, he should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved Jen, that God gave Jen his only son, that if Jen believes in him, she should not perish, but have eternal life. God is very intentional and specific. We like to keep it broad. God doesn't do that. He keeps it very intimate, very personal, and very intentional. Just like he's, if, if this, there's, there's any semblance of truth in what I'm saying, that's what's, what he's saying here. Okay, I'm closing now for the last time. Let's go back to 37-year-old Shia LaBeouf. I don't handle fame well. <clears throat> most actors on most days don't think they're worthy. I have no idea where this insecurity comes from, but it's a God-sized hole. <clears throat> and if I knew, I'd fill it and I'd be on my way. Okay, 37-year-old Shia LaBeouf meet 400-year-old Blaise Pascal, mathematician, ph philosopher, he writes, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, and it can never be filled by any created thing. Don't miss that word, created thing. It can only be filled by God, made known 
through Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. What if all the stuff that we have as Americans in some way fulfilled the purpose of frustrating the hell out of us? That showed us that none of the stuff, none of the created things, none of the things we accumulate in the dash, nothing in our storage units, <laughs> our houses, our 401k plans, our bank accounts, our investment plans, nothing in our kids or our spouses or our health. What if that frustration pointed us to the real source of life? Because we found out this is not giving me what I thought it would. Could we just spend some time over the course of these weeks? Now look, in the next seven weeks, there will be 1,776 hours. I'm sure you all knew that. 1,776 hours. I am just asking you for 17.5 of those hours, which will give you 1,158 and a half hours to do anything you want with. So would you consider just coming back, enjoying dinner, making some friends, and thinking about, is there more to life than this? Okay, now we're going to take a quick break. Before we do that, though, um, uh, in a moment, it's going to get kind of loud in here. A lot of people talking. So try to, again, be loud so your table can hear you, but only one person talking at a table. And, I, and look, and you don't, have to, you don't have to speak, but there is this article I read said, happy people talk more and with more substance. So if you don't say anything, we're just going to assume you're depressed and really shallow. So... <laughs> So don't let that happen. Just kidding. Thank you for being here. We hope to see you next week. Hope you'll register. Let's take a quick break, coffee, bathrooms, and head back to our tables. Thank you for coming.